got to give uh, huge props to Jordan, Jordan Larson, uh, or a lot of our players call her the Gov, short for the governor, the unofficial governor of Nebraska. When we had no season last year and just some small group training around here, and then she had a short China season and an Athletes Unlimited season, but she had a lot of time to be able to work on herself physically. And she came into this tournament absolutely the best prepared, the most explosive that I've ever seen her and that she's ever been. And so it's no surprise that she probably had the best tournament she's ever had uh, for USA. Welcome to Inside the Coaching Mind, conversations on leadership, coaching, and team building. Your host, Terry Pettit, led the University of Nebraska Cornhusker volleyball team from 1977 to 1999 and coached Nebraska's first ever national championship in 1995. Today, Coach Pettit mentors coaches, authors books, and presents to corporations and businesses on leadership and team building. Karch Karai had already won three individual Olympic gold medals as a competitor when he became the head coach of the USA Women's National Volleyball Team in 2012. In August, Karai led his team to the gold medal in the Tokyo Olympics. Karai talks about his leadership group and the culture that was created that allowed the team to flourish despite several unforeseen challenges during the Olympics. I'm Dave Young, producer of the podcast. Thanks for joining us. And now, here's Coach Terry Pettit. This is Terry Pettit with Inside the Coaching Mind. And today, we have a very special guest. A few days ago, we asked members of our Facebook group, Inside the Coaching Mind, who they would like to have if they could ask anyone to come on a podcast. And two names arose uh, above the rest, Karch Karai and Jordan Larson. Jordan will be our guest toward the end of next week, but our guest today is the head coach of the USA women's volleyball team that recently won the gold medal in Japan. Karch, on behalf of the volleyball community and the thousands of women who have played and who are playing the most popular team sport in this country, I would like to thank you, your staff, and the members of the USA women's Olympic volleyball team for a courageous gold medal winning performance in Tokyo. Welcome to Inside the Coaching Mind. Well, thank you very much. Really kind of you. Um, the congratulations really go to these special badass 12 people who uh, these women who comprise this amazing team and took care of business and to all that came before. Um, Jen joins Thomas, who uh, obviously worked with Chris with the Husker program for a few years, calculated it out, and there have now been, I think, 109 female Olympians who've represented the USA in indoor volleyball. And it took 11 actual tries plus a boycott, a 12th before on the 13th. We got it done, but uh, our players and our team stand on the work of so many of those who came before and helped lay clear the path for this. And, and I think the women that played on that 1980 team in particular um, just had to be elated when they saw um, this championship, this, this gold medal. They're such a great story. And a lot of people, ooh, I'm getting, um, my team either laughs at me, usually at me or with me, but I get goosebumps, karch bumps a lot over uh, little things like this. But our 1980 team really set the trend and set um, American volleyball on a different path. A lot of people don't know, but the, uh, the first time indoor volleyball was added to the Olympic program was in 1964 in Tokyo. They added it for men and for women. So many people don't know that that was the first true team sport added for women to the Olympic program before basketball, before soccer, before field hockey, before all the other ones. And our teams, both men and women, eh, did okay in 64 and 68, and then were not good enough to qualify in the next two Olympics. And the big lesson was, you know what? We can't go about this the way we have been. Assemble an all-star team two weeks before the Olympic qualifier or two weeks before the Olympics themselves and expect to contend. And so that group 
of 1980 Olympians, those female Olympians, were the first to break that bad streak of not qualifying. They were one of the top five teams in the world, and they did it by getting together and training year round in Texas starting in 1977. And they qualified, but then they did not get to compete thanks to the boycott that President Carter imposed at that time. And, but they started a new trend. And since then, both the women and the men have been competing at every Olympic Games and very often contending for the podium. So huge uh, gratitude that we have for that team. And it just so happened that they had a 40-year reunion scheduled for last year during the Olympics. But because of COVID and lockdowns, they delayed it a year. And so they were having their reunion right during, ooh, I'm getting them again, uh, the, those bu uh, karch bumps, uh, right during week one of our competition. And they were up in Colorado Springs having a great time sending us support videos. Our team recorded videos for them. And it just, uh, it was really special to have that connection to the team that really started the trend of greatness in American volleyball indoors. Uh, that's that's wonderful. When when the when the final match was over and and there's a pile and everybody's celebrating, does where did you regroup? Where uh, did you regroup and meet? I assume you did in either the locker room or a waiting room. Um, there's so much going on that it's actually really difficult to uh, to get together after that. Um, First of all, we had some players who had to provide both urine and blood for doping samples, and they immediately get separated off from the herd. So you can't get access to them until they get that finished. So really, the one time we were all together was about uh, five minutes after the podium ceremony and medal ceremony finished. Somebody had passed me information. Uh, about the all tournament team and every FIVB, every major event, they have an all tournament team, but they chose not to have any announcement or ceremony at the gym. Obviously there are no fans there, so it wouldn't be announcing it to many people, but under normal circumstances, they do have that. They had that at volleyball nations league VNL earlier this year but they did not have it there. So I, I took matters into my own hands. And so we gathered our whole staff and our whole team. And I just said, I just learned about the all tournament awards. And so we had a celebration as five out of the seven awards went to Americans. All tournament outside hitter, basically one of the two best outside hitters of the Olympics uh, or both the two best, Michelle Barch Hackley and Jordan Larson. Uh, one of the two all-tournament middles, Haley Washington, uh, the all-tournament setter, Jordan Poulter, and maybe the unsung hero of the Olympics, the all-tournament libero, best tournament of the Olympic, uh, best libero of the Olympics, or libero, depending on how you pronounce it or want to pronounce it, Justine wong Arantes, and she was absolutely fabulous. And then the extra award on top of that, after the team went nuts for Justine, was MVP Jordan Larson, who had now completed her collection with a silver in London, a bronze in Rio. And we got the other color that we'd been hungry, hungering for. We got her a gold. Uh, she played a huge part in getting that gold. And so uh, she's got every color now and I'm just so happy for her. Will, will there be a, a point in the near future where you get together with this group and talk about what happened and why it happened? I'm not sure we'll be able to. They live such um, difficult volleyball lives. A number of them are going to have to be going back overseas soon to uh, report for their club teams for preseason. Um, we made history in Tokyo, but uh, we're, we're making history in another way right now. We're, we've got the biggest run of women's national team weddings going on that we've ever had so that's fabulous in fact i'm a lot of us are coming to omaha this week jordan has her big reception in omaha on friday the same day meg and courtney's getting married in a different location in a different state and then annie drew's a week later 
Kelsey Robinson. And so we've got a whole slate of marriages going on. And, and uh, those are massive and historic events themselves. And we're happy that we'll be able to celebrate those. So we'll have kind of mini reunions at some of those. Who was the first person you called in the United States after winning the gold? Who? Wow. Um, I think I called my wife. Uh, and the reason I'm drawing a bit of a blank on it is because I didn't make many calls. My phone, as everybody's phone was, was just blowing up with wonderful messages, texts, WhatsApp messages, uh, emails, voicemails, you name it, it was coming through. There was barely even <laughs> a break to be able to make a call like that, but mostly I wanted to thank my wife for the, uh, the incredible support that she has provided me and made it possible for me to uh, be a part of this very difficult uh, pursuit that involves a lot of suffering. But at the end, it, uh, it ended up paying off on that 13th try at the Olympics. Despite being ranked number one in the world and despite your success in the Volleyball Nations League, this wasn't easy. Uh, in the first, uh, first couple of matches, uh, I think a couple things uh, stuck out to everybody. One was the amazing athleticism of people who hadn't seen Jordan Thompson before. Uh, she, she literally was capable of getting a kill no matter how many people committed in, a, in, a, in an area. And the other was that uh, Jordan Poulter struggled initially and particularly struggled setting the middle. I think I was surprised by that. I saw her play her senior year and what always impressed me, I saw her play a match at Northern Colorado where Illinois had played Colorado State in the morning, came over to Northern Colorado and I'm, and I'm assuming that the players thought this is something we'll get through pretty quick. But Illinois found themselves down 11 to 7 in the fifth, and she took over. And she didn't take over by dumping the ball or physically doing things. It was her command and presence. And I always thought that was the most interesting thing about her. It's a, an almost un, indescribable quality of having command in, in all types of situations, but it didn't happen early on. And, and I guess I can speculate about that, but you would have better insight into that. What, why do you think that maybe, was that just because she's playing in her first Olympic competition? I wasn't uh, super Worried by any means. Jordan Poulter has, you're right, an ability to have a commanding presence, an ability to connect with her idols like Jordan Larson. She grew up idolizing Jordan, and now she's got to figure out a way to work together with her. But in my mind, it's like, okay, yeah, Maybe the middle's not going quite. It might even be a little bit of a surprise, but the middles weren't going as well as they were all through Volleyball Nations League, through VNL. But um, I had confidence that it would come around. We just need to give it some time and, and, uh, and um, play through that. The other thing is people just, and I'm not saying you're not, uh, you're doing this, but people just got to cut her some slack. She's the youngest player on our team. She's never played in Olympics before. Uh, she did not win an NCAA title, although she came awfully close. They had that incredible battle in the fifth game uh, of the semifinal. I think it was against Nebraska one year, but um, uh, so when you're the youngest on the team and you've never played in Olympic games and you haven't ever played in a world championship and you just joined the, the team a couple of years ago, not every game is going to be smooth and easy and beautiful. Um, and we did work through that and it wasn't, there was no magic pill or magic wand. It was just, let's play a little more and we'll get back to what we've been doing. Yeah. The real question for me and, and, the people, a lot of the people that listen to this podcast are coaches. 
is how did you develop the patience to allow her to work through it? Was that there? You began coaching with the with USA Volleyball in 2009 as an assistant to, to um, oh my God, my, the name slips me. To Hugh McCutcheon, yeah, with uh, who's now with Minnesota, exactly. Right, but but um, that's not necessarily natural for a beginning coach. How long did it take for you to get that type of perspective? To just and we saw it several times throughout these games. There were several times when um, a less experienced coach or a less trusting coach might have substituted, whether it was for the setter or an outside hitter who'd not scored or um, several different things. But in every case, you chose to ride with the person that, that you had uh, trust in. Um... I think the first thing is uh, you have all of these amazing players who happen to be amazing people, and they have such a, uh, a body of work, of history. And so we started Jordan Poulter all through the 2019 World Cup. That was our, um, uh, our first big event after qualifying for the Olympics. We ended up getting second there. We only lost one match. And there were stretches during that tournament where our offense was absolutely devastating. And uh, then she had a phenomenal uh, club season this past year, playing for a team in Italy called Busto Arsizio. And coach after coach, often unsolicited, would come to me and say, I don't know what's going on, but Jordan Poulter is blowing my mind because they have no star players, no players that the volleyball world would know as a top this or a top that. And they just keep winning through European champion, uh, through Champions League in Europe. And so she had a history of that. And I also saw how calm and cool and collected she was through World Cup, through this year's VNL. And we played all the way through to winning that. Now we know that winning that gave us nothing. And as soon as it was done, I tried to let the team know, and they knew already, this means nothing. This does not buy us squat uh, when it comes to the Olympics because Serbia didn't have their top line up there. Italy didn't have their top line up there. And there have been other years when we have won 2018, 2019, and then gone on not to win the world championships or not to win the world cup. So yes, it was nice. And she took care of business there and she handled uh, any challenge and adversity that we had during that. So you put that all together and it was easy to have uh, a lot of trust in her and to have a lot of trust in all of our other players. And we also had tremendous trust in the people who, uh, I guess we would call them, uh, uh, the USA women's soccer coach came to speak to our team just uh, days before we departed for Tokyo, Jill Ellis. And she had a lot of great things to share. And one of them was that they loved her term for people who are not starters. Uh, she calls them game changers, um, or you could call them specialists. And we had five of those, and we had absolute trust that any one of them could also do the job. Uh, Annie Drews was certainly one of those, and Kelsey, and Chiaka, um, and Micah Hancock, and so we're, um, and, and Kelsey Robinson. So those five people we also had trust in, and it was just a matter of trying to figure out how much uh, patience to have. And when things aren't going uh, very well, like against Russia, we got our butts kicked against Russia, we owe it to the team to try to make some changes and find a solution that will work better, regardless of who the starters are. Mm -hmm. Well, every, everything changed in the, in the match against Turkey when Jordan went out with an injury because um, the, the team had relied upon her. I mean, it seemed like the offense was really uh, focused on her, whether she was in the front row or back row. And so... Deservedly so. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. If it ain't broke, don't yeah. fix it. Keep feeding the beast. Annie Drews comes in and plays well and plays even better. Uh, the longer the tournament went, the, yeah. the better she played. But she's a different type of player. And, uh, you know, my, my evaluation of what I saw was this, this team does not win the Olympic gold medal without extraordinary passing. Uh, and you ended up having the number one, two, and three um, passers in the Olympic Games. I, I, I would doubt that that ever happened before. Probably the best passing performance I've ever seen as a USA coach. It was off the charts. Huge right. props to Jordan Larson, Michelle Barchakli, Justine Wangarantes. You mentioned Jordan and um, a, a little side note that not many people know, but we have three Jordans on our team. So only one of them gets to be Jordan. And we all know who that's got to be. <laughs> that's got to be Jordan Larson. So then Jordan Thompson uh, goes by JT. And then Jordan Poulter goes by Pult. And that way they all know when to turn their heads when somebody's calling their name. That's good. Um, well, had they passed at that level during the, during the volleyball league? They did pass at a nice level, but this was another big clip up. And um, I think it's the best passing tournament that Jordan Larson's ever had. Certainly the best one Justine has had, and definitely the one, the best one that Michelle Barch Hackley, we call her Barchi, has ever had. And the three of them combined were, like I said, off the charts. So that made things a lot easier. Um, Got to give uh, huge props to Jordan, Jordan Larson. Uh, or a lot of our players call her the Gov, short for the governor, the unofficial governor of Nebraska. And um, just because she's such a huge and rightly so a hugely popular uh, person there. Uh, but Jordan, um, when we had no season last year and just some small group training around here, and then she had a short China season and athletes unlimited season, but she had a lot of time to be able to work on herself physically. And she came into this tournament, absolutely the best prepared, the most explosive that I've ever seen her and that she's ever been. And so it's no surprise that she probably had the best tournament she's ever had uh, for USA. Wow. Well, when, when Annie Drews came off the bench and played well, uh, Heather Cox interviewed her and she said um, one thing we've really asked of our coaches this year is role clarity. And uh, I, you know, use that word game changer. I believe she used that word in, in that, um, that interview. Um, but what intrigued me was the phrase, one thing we've asked of, of our coaches which ind indicates a much more collaborative process. That's not a transact transactional coaching where most of us kind of grow up under transactional coaching, sometimes in youth volleyball, where somebody just tells you to do something and you, and you, and you do it. But how did this come about? Uh, I, and I'm curious what Sue Inquist's role was in bringing that about, or did she have a role in that? Great question. And Sue played a, a huge and very important part um, in what we accomplished recently in Tokyo. Um, it was early in 2020. And so this is about a year and a half ago. Um, we uh, staff decided to go a little different route. We had a wonderful woman who was really good as a sports psychologist, but some things just hadn't quite clicked. It's nobody's fault that uh, things didn't quite click with our team. So we decided to go in a different direction. That was a, a, a risky move. At that time, we thought the Olympics were still going to happen in July of 2020. So this was only months before the Olympics. That's not an optimum time to make a switch or a change in staff. But um, 
so while we're working through that process, um, uh, I just said we were having weekly Zoom meetings to keep our team together. We have a core group of 23 players, only 12 of whom actually were able to go to Tokyo, but we've often talked about how we, we are 23 strong with these 23, this core group of 23 players. And so just through some of the people I know in sports, um, I asked some people to come visit with our team. And the very first guest we had on our Zoom team Zoom meeting was Sue Enquist. And she knocked it out of the park. The team absolutely fell in love with her. And um, so she said, hey, you know, here's my contact info. If you guys ever have any questions, just let me know. Feel free to reach out. She was really generous with her time. And we had other great guests like Billie Jean King, uh, Julie Foudy and Carla Overbeck, who were the co-captains of the 99ers, the great World Cup winning USA women's soccer team. But Sue made a special impression. And at the same time, we were beginning our search to uh, make a change in uh, on that staff position. Our team had been feeling a little bit, we had had a lot of changes, new players coming to join the team like JT, like Dana Redke playing, uh, spending some time with us and Mary Lake and other new faces in 2019. And we'd just gone through lots of changes and the team felt this void. Uh, they didn't feel like they knew each other well enough. They didn't feel like they had the connection that they really wanted to have, uh, which would lead to the trust that they really wanted to have. They wanted to um, build their accountability, wanted to build uh, through democratic processes, uh, just a more cohesive unit. And so I asked our leadership group, um, which is five or six people plus Faluka, I said, would you guys be an interview committee to help us choose this new person? And they said, we'd, we'd love to as, as we are trying to uh, let them play these bigger roles. And so early on in that process, they said, we know it's unorthodox, but what would you think of Sue filling that position, Sue Inquist. She's not a sports psychologist or uh, maybe the more common term now is mental performance coach, but we think that she could be a great facilitator. We've had some offline discussions, some in, just, just uh, informal spontaneous discussions with her. We liked what happened and we'd like to really think about that. And so um, uh, they made a great case. And so we went with that. Uh, again, um, unorthodox because Sue is not that traditional mental performance coach, but then they did a ton of work, the team and Sue, mostly without us coaches, on things like getting to know each other better, how to be a better teammate for each other, how to communicate with us better, how to ask us and make their case um, better. So one of the first times they did was uh, probably in early July of last year. We had some people, but not everybody here in Anaheim as we were in small group training, working through lockdown. And they said, we'd like to have a meeting and wanna present some thoughts to you. And they did. And they said, we don't think that you, Karch and your staff and your other coaches um, named the starting team early enough before World Cup. You named it once we got there. We had about four or five days. We don't think that was optimum for leading us to our best performance. And so they made their case. They made a great case. We had gone through it uh, months earlier as a staff and had already agreed with that criticism and that feedback that we did wait too long. And so um, we said, thank you for making that case. You made a great case and we completely agree with you. And so uh, we're gonna be better about naming that sooner so the team gets a little more time to work together. So as soon as we got back from VNL, um, in fact, we test drove, it was like a test drive for our starting lineup, those last two matches in VNL. 
with an aim toward clarifying roles sooner, clarifying who would be a starter and who would be a game changer, things like that. And so that was uh, in large part a reaction to just one issue that the team came together around and, and, and argued a really well-reasoned and well-articulated case, a case that we happened to agree with. How long had you had a, a leadership group? Uh, we've had a leadership group since I became coach our first year. And for, uh, well, for much, I guess, by the end, near, near, as we got to Rio, we had a group of four. Uh, the people on that, uh, let's see, were Tama Miyashiro, Courtney Thompson, Alicia Glass, and our captain, Kristen, uh, Krista Hermato dietzen uh, now our leadership council is not four, but five people. It'll evolve. Uh, we, we weren't sure if we should, we named it in the second half of the 2019 season, but we were apart for so long, there was no reason to change it going into this year. And so that's Micah Hancock, Megan Courtney, Tori Dixon, Kim Hill, and Jordan Larson. That, that was our group of five. Uh, but they weren't the only ones to articulate some of these things. But that leadership group did uh, a tremendous job of being the interface and advocating on behalf of the players uh, toward us coaches when it needed to be done and also advocating the other direction as we would ask leaders to do sometimes to say, look, this is what we need to do um, and be advocates for our side to their teammates. And that was one of the blessings of having Sue so intimately involved in this process. She's such a long time coach, head coach. She knows the landscape. And so I think she emphasized that to them a lot, like, look, you guys, maybe you don't quite understand what they're trying to do here. Uh, here's, here was a small thing they wanted to get better at and we wanted them to get better at. It would be wonderful if there was a little less focus on who's a starter and who's not a starter. Um, and Sue would make that case to them. Look, you guys need to be chess pieces for them. You need to just be ready and be put in this role as Bishop or this role as Rook or Pawn or whatever, depending on the case may be. They might even ask you to be ready for a different starting lineup every single Olympic match. And you need to be ready for that. And so that would, that would be an example. We would never do that, but she was emphasizing a point of, look, um, I'm here to help you be flexible and let the coaches do their job. And that is to plug the pieces in where they think it's going to cause the most trouble for opponents. Um, I, I know Sue, we've, I've been fortunate to present with her several times. She brings a tremendous energy and insight and experience. And uh, I think, I think um, I'm sure she did a great job for you. Um, She's done a fabulous job, and I sure hope she continues. Uh, it's, it's been amazing, and today happens to be her birthday, so we're sending out good thoughts to her. Well, Bill Walton, the uh, former head coach at Houston, asked this question. He, he wanted to know, uh, beyond playing well, what, what roles or responsibility does, it, does your team captain have um, beyond that? Well, um, I think uh, Jordan, as our captain, helped lead us through an incredibly challenging last year and a half. The whole world suffered uh, in so many ways with all that's gone on with COVID and social justice issues and everything else. And so she helped guide this team through all that. And it was a ton of work. So, um, you know, uh, she's the first person that people might go to who might have a question for, for the leadership council or a question for the coaches because they often pass those, uh, players will often pass those through. Um, and have a feeling of a little more safety. Let's say it's a question that they feel is not so safe to ask, even though we would hope 
that we've made it safe enough to ask any question. But um, so a good way to do it is to route it through the leadership council. And of course, the, the strong head of that group is Jordan. So um, she sets the standard in terms of uh, work ethic. Uh, so that is wonderful when your best player is, or one of your best players, the best, I don't know who's best on this team. They're all so amazing, but when your best player, or one of your best players is also your hardest worker or one of your hardest workers that uh, nobody has a choice, but to follow that lead. And she also has a tremendous sense of humility. She does. Um, and I think one of the great things about spending so much time together is uh, it gave people a chance to get to know Jordan a little more. On the court, she has this very imposing presence. She has a very strong presence. And she doesn't mean it that way, but that can be intimidating to opponents and teammates alike. And so I think it was great that they got all this extra time. Ultimately, these extra 12 months were a huge gift to us to be able to do that extra work, sharpen our swords more. And even a little thing like getting to know Jordan more so that, um, uh, so that she, they could think of her as more approachable and uh, to grab a coffee with her and pepper her with questions as any young player should. They should be... Um, uh, absolutely picking her brain every second that they have free to, to learn from uh, what I believe is the greatest um, female American player in, in our country's history. Wow. That's quite a statement. Um, the Russia match. I, um, my wife, who knows something about volleyball, but she certainly doesn't um, she, she's uh, not a former collegiate coach, said after the match, I don't think Russia made a mistake. Um, they, they appeared to play almost perfect volleyball. They, I, I believe the service aces were six to one. They, they attacked at a very high level. And I'm curious if there's an emotional component to this um, and the emotional component would be this. Does, does Russia see USA as its rival? Was this a rivalry match for them? We think of every match as a rivalry match. Nobody wants USA to win. We've got a target on our <laughs> back or on our, our front every time we put a uniform on. So we know that whenever we do, people will bring their best. They usually play their best against us. Doesn't hurt that we're very highly ranked. So people get excited about trying to take down one of the top ranked teams in the world. I think we were number one ranked at the time, maybe still. Um, so we, we just took one opponent at a time. We knew that Argentina is capable of playing some good volleyball, but after that, there were no gimmies. Turkey showed, they just mowed down China and we barely got by. Uh, so then we had a tough China match, barely get past Turkey and there's no time to come up for air. You gotta be ready for, we had to be ready for Russia and we had to be ready for Italy. Uh, so, I don't know that there was any emotional letdown. It's just that Russia played quite well and uh, we didn't quite figure out the answer. We tried some different combinations. We tried substituting. I think we got closest to the answer and we were at 18 all in the third game, had a nice pass. I think we had a, hit a front one or a tight quick out of bounds and then things um, spun out of control from there. But probably the most important thing that I, that, that we knew and I had been saying all along is nobody gets through a tournament like that unscathed. Right. Everybody is going to lose and maybe take it in the chops. And so that's what we did. And so we, uh, the probably one critical thing we did was we called a meeting that night. That was an 11 a.m. match called them back together. And I just emphasized to the group that, yeah, 
Russia played great, didn't go our way. We got a great chance to um, bounce back here. And you look at the history. We got clobbered during the 2014 World Championships. We came back and won that tournament. You look at the history of Olympic champions, uh, maybe five out of the six last Olympic champions. Now with us, six out of the last seven lost at least once if not more before winning that tournament. Just the last Olympics, China lost three times in round robin and then go on to win quarter semis finals. France, the men's side barely gets out of pool and they win the gold medal. So this is just all standard. This is not a surprise. And the, the thing that we have is that is always and completely in our control is, the, is not what happens on the scoreboard, but how we respond. And that's where we formulated a great response. And, and my observation was not USA. It was Russia. Yeah. Did, did, you know, were they, because they couldn't maintain that. No, I think their else. opposite was unstoppable. She had about 500 something. And then one of their outsides, they had just two pins who completely went off on us. And we did very little to slow them down. So uh, part of that is on us. And part of that was, you're right. Russia was great, but it's very easy when a team plays like that for the opponent that they, whose butt they kicked to lose confidence, um, get, um, get frustrated, get uh, demotivated. Uh, all, we could have allowed ourselves to go lots of places because that loss was not pretty. We got clobbered. And so it was really important to say, look, we could be thinking this, but we're not going to be. And we could be thinking that and we're not going to be. We're going to get right back on the horse and, and get our train on the rails and go at Italy. Well, I think it, it tested your culture. I think Absolutely. that, that uh, uh, on August 2nd, you have a five set match with Italy. And in the third set, Jordan goes down with a, uh, what turned out to be a uh, a sprained ankle, but not a maybe not a, a severe sprain. So you're down two to one, and uh, Micah comes in, and you're able to rally and come back, and uh, win that match. Probably a signature match for Annie Drews. Um, she she comes up big time uh, as an as an attacker, and I understand how all these matches are equal. But to me, this match may have been the most important match in getting to a, to to the medal to the uh, the gold medal match. What it revealed in terms of of uh, depth, what it revealed in in terms of trust, what it revealed in terms of preparation. Your thoughts on that? How we responded to that loss against Russia and how we responded even to the adversity of the Italy match down to one and now down two starters um, is exactly how each of our players as players and teammates and people would have wanted to respond. And that's how we had wanted to respond as a, as a program. Um, one of our big aspirations going into this was we don't have um, a player like the Serbian opposite or the Italian opposite, or maybe sometimes the Russian opposite who com can completely take over a match all by herself, in system, out of system, whatever, clean up the trash and just put the team on her shoulders. Uh, we don't play that way. We don't have a player like that. We don't ache for a player like that. We love to play team volleyball, but our aspiration was we just need to out team the team across the opponent across the net and uh, maybe more so than any other match we out teamed Italy and that seemed to open the floodgates we got through the adversity of a loss to Russia the adversity of being down two players and two sets to one to Italy win that we still didn't know what that meant by the end of the day it meant that we were back at the top of our group and getting, uh, earning ourselves a better quarterfinal draw. 
but it seemed to open the floodgates. And from that point forward, it's easy to look back now and see that it didn't feel like it at the time. I guess now you could say, well, of course we, we should have won. Look at the way we were playing, but Dominican is incredibly dangerous. Serbia is reigning world champions and Brazil is Brazil. So um, I never would have, I would have lost a lot of money if somebody had told me, yeah, you're going to win 3-0, 3-0, 3-0 against those three great teams. Well, with, with a talent like um, Jordan Thompson or Catherine Plummer, would they advance faster? Would they develop faster if their first year out of college and, and being associated with the U.S. team, if they, that first year they were in year-round training with the U.S. team rather than going to Europe? Or are they going to develop faster just playing against top teams in Europe? That's an intriguing question. Uh, part of the problem with the hypothesis of the question is the assumption that year round training takes place here. Right. But and it, it does doesn't. not. We basically have almost nobody here in November, December, January, right. February. Then people start trickling back in. So I, I don't think solo training would be of much no. help but if we had people around yeah it might help but there is also something even if people are getting very little feedback and coaching in terms of technical or tactical coaching there's something about um earning a good living as a volleyball player and having the responsibility of producing a team signed you, they're paying you to play well for their team. And um, you have to weather the storm when you have a, a loss to a lower team in Italy or Turkey, it's like a uh, disaster, you know, one loss for a top team, most teams respond to it like an utter disaster and then on the other hand when they have a, a nice win it's like they've won the olympics and it's a roller coaster and so it's really important to learn how to ride out those storms and play with a more even keel um, jordan larson being such a great example of how to play really strong and evenly and always at a high level and not uh, play with great emotional highs and lows. Do you, I suspect that you don't, but I want to ask the question anyway. Do you have any input or do you share any input with players on which coaches or teams might be better for them to play with because they might develop technically or tactically and also where they might not be overworked? I do share some, but often their choices are dictated by the market. Uh, so it might be that somebody is just facing two lousy choices um, and neither are going to be great. And so what's the big lesson? The big lesson is, uh, and I talk about this a lot, like, can you find a buddy on the team to uh, a, a teammate and to help each other, uh, for example, share with her, hey, my focus today is working on this with my forearm passing. What's your focus today? And to help each other when uh, for a whole season, you might be doing the same practice plan and getting no coaching at all. And so uh, that is a great opportunity to learn how to develop how to take ownership over your own development when other people aren't able to do it for you. Good. But oftentimes what happens is either people have a couple of really good choices or uh, some pretty lousy choices. The easy one that doesn't happen very often is, Hey, you got this really nice choice and this really lousy choice. Well, that, that, that there's not even a choice or anything to agonize over that. Uh, Craig Skinner, the head coach of the national championship winning Kentucky volleyball team asked, um, why did you make the decision to utilize back row attack more in this Olympics than the previous Olympics? Um, mostly because you saw the capability that JT Jordan Thompson could bring to the equation, the height at which she's playing off the floor, 
uh, the distance at which she's playing off the net and Annie Drew's the same. Um, we needed to upgrade our offense in that position. Um, uh, Kelly Murphy did a really nice job and a lover to death. She's a great, great person and a great, great teammate, but she's a little more physically limited than somebody like Jordan Thompson or Annie Drews. And, uh, so, um, we needed to add the capability, for example, that Serbia and Italy have of having a threat in system D behind the setter, out of system D behind the setter. You see it on the guy's side all the time, uh, but we need to be able to not always have to run slide behind the setter. We sometimes want to keep our quick hitters in front of the setter and have the D uh, be a threat there. And those two have made it a huge threat and it was, it's just far more efficient now. Mm -hmm. Lori Endicott, you mentioned, we talked about culture, but Lori uh, Endicott asked, um, what, what can you do at the club level or the high school level? Now you've got parents involved in getting players to embrace their roles. Um, that's a big, big challenge and no easy answers there, but um, that's where I got my start was coaching our boys in high school. And so I thought I might face a little less of the, uh, <laughs> of the parental thing that lasted about two days. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> so I, I got immersed in that and um, um I think part of it is trying to um, explain and involve parents more. They may respond well, they might not, but just to let them know, here's what, our, what my plan is for this team. Here's what we're trying to do. We can't have 14 starters on this team, but we can have a team that can have um, a wonderful experience. And, and, and a number of those parents might have played team sports themselves. Often people do growing up. And we can all remember a special team that we played on. Um, I remember from your book, I think one of the things that stands out, I remember a timeout that you called late in the NCAA tournament. And I think you figure, you know what, I, I, I don't have anything tactically or technically to say, and you just decided to tell your team you loved them. And then I think it was your captain or somebody else uh, made everybody <laughs> laugh and said, well, you still can't have my blood, but my bud light. So <laughs> I'm not giving you that, but, uh, but the closeness that that team had, your players will never forget that our players will never forget that. And if we can provide an experience like that for young people will win them for this sport forever. And so parents have often had teams that weren't very fun because of drama, because of lack of trust, uh, lack of role clarity, whatever. And so uh, I try to tie it in a little with having them remember their best team experience, because those are really special, even if you barely played to be a part of something bigger than you and to play a role, which is not necessarily tied to the minutes you spend on the floor. That's a really powerful thing. Those are some of the best memories all of us have in team sports. Um, as an observer, it appeared to me when USA got to the medal rounds and, and, and particular, particularly the, the, uh, the final two matches that the tempo sped up. And it seemed like attackers were getting, hitting at the apex of the ball. It reminded me to some degree of what we saw from Kentucky in the NCAA championships. People were getting off the floor faster. Is that my imagination or was that a, was that a deliberate um, destination? I think we just got more comfortable. We do that every day in training uh, a lot. We did that a lot during Volleyball Nations League. So that is the way we play. We try to stress people out by, you know, our, our big uh, part of our DNA is being great at first, uh, at the first contact of the ball, at the service line on the one side and in serve reception on the other. And our serve reception was off the charts. People kept getting more comfortable. 
Jordan Poulter could ke keep pushing the speed. It got Jordan and Barchi going on the left and Annie going on the right. And then we got Haley going and Faluka in front. And now there are just threats everywhere. And, um, uh, and so as they got through some of the roughness, um, it wasn't anything anybody really said, or we didn't spend any extra time working on it on the off days. It was just, we got back to what we see happening a lot inside our gym which is a lot of crisp side out volleyball. I, I mentioned one of the DNA things, first contact. The other is just side out till the cows come home because you cannot lose if you side out better than the other team. And so our side out offense is our other key strength. Um, one of the, my great friends and a mentor of mine and one of the greatest uh, volleyball coaches and coaches of all time, Marv Dunphy has always said every great team has to have two or three strengths it can always or nearly always depend on and we depended on those and they show shown through brightly first contact domination and side out volleyball and, and you were wearing some airpods of some sort during the match i assume that those were hooked up to marv and when what type of information is is he giving you during the match I actually, we went into the Olympics and I wanted to be connected with Mar, but our radio channels got a little messed up. So the one person I'm always connected to on that and couldn't get Marv in on that channel is our uh, technical analyst, our scout, our, our, uh, our statistics guy, Jeff Liu, we call him Hefe. And he is phenomenal. And I just... Um, sometimes he'll throw ideas out to me. Hey, have you thought about this? Uh, we're struggling here. Have you thought about making a substitution there? Uh, have you thought about a short serve here? He's just kind of throwing, as he would say, throwing mud against the wall and seeing what sticks. And so I like having um, somebody uh, to kind of jolt me out of uh, certain ways of thought. I also wanted to hear that from Marv because uh, he's been to something like nine Olympics now. And so he's by, he's just somebody that we trust implicitly and he sees the game at such a high level and he has such great perspective. And so that's who I was connected with. And, you know, I, I, in looking at your staff, uh, it looks like almost everybody joined uh, US, joined your, your team after Rio, most of them were 2017 on. And um, maybe I could go through this and you can tell me what their role was in this um, wonderful um, experience. Uh, Luke, it says, uh, is, he's listed as your defensive coordinator, blocking coach. Um, how much is he communicating with players during the match? Lucas uh, did a tremendous job. He joined us in 2018. We love him. This staff, I, I don't, I can't imagine a better one. There probably is somewhere on the planet, but we are so lucky to have the staff that we had. Um, uh, and Luca was a part of that now off, of course, to North Carolina State and the ACC. But yes, as defensive coordinator, he was um, uh, not, he didn't build our um, game plans for opponents by himself. He did a lot of that work with Tama Miyashiro and with Jeff, uh, and they came up with great plans for our opponents. But so if we have adjustments to make, he'll call it out. He might call out a call into the, if a team is streaking the quick, he might call in um, to a middle to, to commit on that, or a middle might say, Hey, Luca, what do you think of me committing there? And he'll say, great. I like it. You're, you're taking command of changing something in the equation. So mm -hmm. Luca has got a ton of passion and, and we're going to miss him dearly. Uh, if, and then we have Aaron virtue as our offensive coordinator. And so we, uh, she's the one who we're and, and our setters coach. And she, uh, does the most work with, the setters on developing the other game plan, the offensive game plan. And so we try to carve them away or uh, 
give them time during every timeout. So Aaron would check in with the two setters to see what was working and what needed to, to change, if anything. And, and Aaron, Tama Aaron does a great job as our, uh, um, she can coach anywhere in any phase of the game. She helps our, uh, in the matches, she helps with floor defense and she's also basically our passers coach. And she, so we got to give her a ton of credit for having probably the best passing performance we've ever had. Right. Uh, there, there was one match I noticed Aaron was not on the bench. Later learned that she was um, uh, isolated because she'd been near somebody with COVID. How long did that isolation last? 14 days. Aaron would have been better off catching COVID than <laughs> being assigned the seat that she was assigned on our flight over. We didn't know this at the time. Had we known it at the time, I think we literally, uh, your laugh maybe, but I think we would have done it. We should have all worn hazmat suits on the way over because what happens is if you have a, a flight with two seats on each side and three in the middle and this middle person has COVID and tests positive at the airport, that person is considered to have uh, so the six people in that row around that person and the seven people in the row in front and the seven people in the row in front of that and the seven people in the row behind and the seven people in the row behind that are all considered contaminated. So one person and one positive test can grind to a halt 34 people on the same flight. Well, that, that speaks to my next question. If US, USA Volleyball had a larger budget, is there something that um, you could do that would have a significant impact on the national teams? Uh, if they had a, and this is something we toyed with before Rio, but, um, and we even asked our players, okay, what, you know, you get paid a lot of money to, to play overseas. How much of a discount would you take on that? If you could skip your final club season and we could keep all of us together and train uh, from October through the Olympics. Uh, and everybody stated a number. It was often 50 to 60% of what they might make overseas. And they would really love to spend that time training together. Obviously, we would go a little nuts because we'd have nobody to play and just go at each other for six or seven months. But people would also get to spend Thanksgiving at home spend the Christmas and the holidays at home. And so that's, that's a big ticket item that we have toyed with in the past. Uh -huh. the, um, the gold medal match was another outlier. Uh, I think uh, statistically going into the match, it looked like Brazil had played better than everybody else in the tournament. However, your pool was much stronger. Um, I guess, I guess the equivalent to what I saw would be a, a team coming out flat or, and there's no more frustrating thing in volleyball as a coach to have your team come out and be flat. And I, I doubt if it was flat, there, you know, but at whatever it was, they had, they had an excellent setter. They have some athletes that have performed very well, but they just didn't seem to be uh, in their A game? Uh, I got to give most of the credit for that to our team. Uh, yes, Brazil played a great tournament up to that point. Uh, we, if you watched carefully, they did have their hands full with Dominican. They beat, it was the only team that took them to five, 15, 12 in the fifth in pool play. And then we, very heavily took care of Dominican. We also beat Serbia more handily than Brazil did. So if you looked at common opponents, then you might not be so surprised. Mm -hmm. uh, and we beat Brazil twice in Nations League. Unlike Italy and Serbia, Brazil was Brazil and we were us during VNL. We had our top players, they did too. So to beat them again, um, I don't know if it was that much of a surprise, even though I had no expectation of winning or losing and know that they're a great team and anything can happen. What I didn't expect was that we would, and I think we did sometime in the third game, I think we really 
we were so good, we broke their will to compete. And it made, and that you never see that happen to Brazil. And that's a credit to how good we were on our side of the net. Yes. And, and I, I looked at the countenance of their coach and uh, who, who, from what I know is a very g- good person, good coach. And um, he almost didn't seem, you know, he, he certainly wasn't angry. He, he, he was kind of in a situation knowing there's nothing I can do about this. I think you read it right. He was very gracious afterward at the, um, at the press conference uh, and just gave me a huge uh, handshake and said, congratulations. I don't think there was much that we could have done on this day to, to change the equation. But um, I know the feeling. They threw a storm at us after we won the first game in London, and we really didn't have answers for them as they mowed us down the next three games. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've had a lot of manners, and I, if you could just give a, uh, a one-sentence answer to each of these on what you got from them. And the first one is your father, Laszlo Karai. Oh, he just has such great passion for the game, uh, uh, lives or dies by the next point. And when you play the next point as hard as you can and then flush that and get ready for the next one, that's a way that you can play in the now and bring out the best in your team. Your head coach at Santa Barbara High School, Rick Olmstead. Rick Olmstead, um, who's led to great coaches like his daughter, Heather, uh, just the commander of hard work and he demanded a ton from us and we did it and we loved doing it for him. He drove us hard and uh, taught me uh, many of the best lessons I know about hard work. Al Skates, you won three national championships at UCLA. Al is the master, 19 titles in 50 years of coaching and um, uh, a lot of people don't know, I don't know, maybe the uh, the rumor would be he doesn't work that hard. He plays a lot of golf. He uh, People have no idea how much he worked and how hard he worked to pick opponents apart and create the best game plans. Doug Beal, uh, former U- <coughs> USA CEO. Your head- Doug, um, uh, our first coach in our 1984 LA Olympic Games, and he and Bill Neville and Tony Crabb were um, just what we needed. We had... Great young talent, but we were really raw and inexperienced. And we needed a ton of work in those three years to go from 19th in the world eventually to first in the world. But uh, his patience and leadership um, and their innovation to come up with like uh, things like the two-passer offense, um, uh, I'm I, very lucky to still call Doug a friend and a mentor. Marv Dumphy. Marv is a great man, a great husband, a great dad, a great coach, um, and now a great officiator of weddings as he just married Jordan and David on Saturday. So that he got to do that, add that to his, uh, a feather to his cap. Marv is just, uh, he's a, a, the most incredible connector with people that I've ever seen. And anytime we can have him be a part of a tournament like the Olympics, it's we're all so much better for the experience. Um, Hugh McCutcheon, who you were. Hugh, uh, I'm so grateful to him for giving me my first chance at international coaching. It was just kind of a random event, but he, I learned so much from him. I was not prepared for anything like, uh, I can look back and I thought I was a decent coach. I was a pretty lousy coach and I'm really thankful for the patience he had in me as a learner and for having given me this, uh, given me this opportunity under, to learn under him. Final one, Jana Karai. Who uh, just the best woman and teammate that I could ever uh, imagine going through life with. We have built an amazing life together and we love it. People would kill me if I didn't ask this question. Um, Perry, will you, <laughs> will you be in Paris? Um, we, uh, earlier this year, I expressed interest in that USA expressed interest in that. And, uh, but the word is, is, uh, with lockdowns, USA volleyball has gone through a lot of financial struggles. And so we had to put that conversation off and I would imagine it will take some uh, place sometime in the next couple of months. 
Well, we'll all keep our fingers crossed. Thank you, Karch, so much for your time. And I, I really appreciate your openness and willing to talk with us. Thank you. Appreciate it. And uh, loved reading your book and your columns. Always love to look for, uh, for other uh, places where I can learn. And so thanks for being a great mentor to coaches out there, not just in volleyball, but uh, in the whole world of sports and beyond. So keep up the great work, Terry. Thank you, Karch. Thanks. That's it for this episode of Inside the Coaching Mind with your host, Coach Terry Pettit. Be sure to subscribe in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love to have you leave a review on iTunes and share the podcast with your friends by tweeting, posting on Facebook, emailing, or just talking about it over a cup of coffee. All the ways to subscribe are posted on terrypettit.com. And don't forget to look for our Facebook group, Inside the Coaching Mind with Terry Pettit. I'm Dave Young. We'll talk to you next time for the next episode of Inside the Coaching Mind.